Hey everybody! When reading feedback about audio in games, be it on projects I've worked on or any other, I notice that some of it is based on expectations about how game audio works that don't quite match reality. Or actually, it's more that the expectations match reality, but game audio doesn't. This might sound a bit abstract at the moment, but don't worry, it will make sense in a minute. Let's start with the very baseline of it all. And let's do so by talking about video game graphics first. I think pretty much everyone who has been following the gaming industry for a while now knows just how far video game graphics have come. Within the past 30 years alone, games went from looking like, you know, games, to something that can force us to look twice in order to make sure we are not looking at a real photograph or video. The two main components for this development have been model fidelity and lighting. Early 3D games featured stylized character models with low polygon counts, simple textures and extremely basic light simulation, if one could even call it that. As computing power and software technology improved, so did the aforementioned areas, giving us today's near photorealism. An important step for the overall visual realism has been the relatively recent introduction of real-time ray tracing and path tracing, technology that tries to simulate realistic behavior of light by sending out virtual light rays and calculating how each ray interacts with the world. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to summarize both with ray tracing moving forward. But again, ray tracing hasn't been around for too long. Older titles and even most newer titles still don't use it. And yet, many of these games manage to look extremely good or even realistic. How come? Well, the explanation is quite simple. Through ingenuity, approximation and trickery. Because an actual ray traced lighting simulation has not been an option for the longest time, developers continuously created more and more systems that try to emulate realistic lighting as close as possible while staying within the capabilities of their contemporary hardware. For example, back when most character models couldn't be very detailed and lighting was rudimentary, finer shadows were usually simply faked by drawing them onto the objects. Other problems were solved with trickery and brute force solutions. Some games simulated mirrors by simply rendering a copy of the scene twice, giving the illusion of watching a reflection. So, to summarize all of this, to this day, video game graphics are based on a lot of clever visual trickery that was continuously developed and refined over the years. The overall picture usually looks pretty, realistic even. But when knowing where to look, it's surprisingly easy to see all the cut corners. All of this was an admittedly somewhat long-winded introduction, so that we have something to compare the world of audio to. You see, just like lighting, sound is a vast and complex physical topic. It consists of different frequencies, it spreads, it bends, it gets reflected and absorbed, and so much more. And just like lighting, audio in video games had to evolve over the years and relies heavily on a lot of approximation and trickery in order to make the sonic experience satisfying and believable. The thing is that, at least according to my perception, the focus of research and development has been heavily focused on visuals, with audio getting a bit more love and attention only recently. While graphics have gotten to a point in which we are approaching the ability of simulating the behavior of light in real time, we are far from doing anything like that with audio. I'd approximate that, compared to today's graphics, sound has just arrived in the PlayStation 2 era. I honestly didn't think about it too much before the topic crossed my mind, but a lot of time in game audio is still spent on creating systems and trickery that try to emulate the behavior of real sound. One could say that we are still drawing shadows on our textures and duplicate scenes in order to create the illusion of mirrors, so to speak. At this point, a reasonable question might pop up. Why? Why do video games still have to trick so much when it comes to audio? And the answer is quite simple. Performance and complexity. We've previously mentioned ray tracing and graphics. It's no secret that ray tracing takes up a lot of computing power, despite still not even being a 100% accurate lighting simulation and cutting a lot of corners. It's the same with sound. No, I'd go even further and say that sound is quite a bit more complicated. I'm convinced that the best way of understanding why audio is so complex to calculate is by understanding its fundamentals. So I'll start with an example and gradually expand its complexity, while also giving insights into how video games solve the arising problems. The trouble already starts at the source. In general, every sound is omnidirectional, meaning it spreads in every direction equally in a spherical manner. And yet, most of us have probably experienced that some sounds are more audible when you are, for example, standing in front of the loudspeaker rather than behind it, right? Yes, this is because of two things. On the one hand, sound can be blocked, 
On the other hand, however, sound can also bend around an object. This is called diffraction. How much a sound bends around an object depends on the frequency of the sound and the size of the object. Simply put, lower frequencies can bend around larger objects than higher frequencies. But a sound does not consist of just one frequency, rather it's an accumulation of a lot of different frequencies. To get back to our speaker example, the lower frequencies of the sound are able to bend around the speaker, while the higher frequencies are not. Games have tried to emulate this behavior for a while now, with a varying degree of complexity. In the simplest cases, they simply scan between the listener and the source of the sound and check if a large object or a wall is present. And if so, the higher frequencies get attenuated. Meaning, just as in most graphics, games do not follow each possible path the sound can take, but rather approximate the result with these simpler checks. Let's add another layer of complexity. Imagine being inside a room with thick walls where someone speaks in the room next to you, connected by an open door. The person's voice will not make it through the wall, but it will make its way to the door frame and bend around it, resulting in you hearing the voice minus some of the higher frequencies that couldn't bend around it. This means you'll hear the voice from the direction of the door frame. Now we are dealing with a situation in which the direction we hear the sound from does not correspond with the position of the sound emitter. A common solution for this that games came up with are portal systems. The basic premise is that the areas are divided into rooms and those rooms are connected via portals. Such a portal could be our door frame. We could now simply say that every sound playing from outside of a room would be played back at the position of the closest portal. That sounds reasonable, right? Well then, let's add another door frame or portal that also leads into the adjacent room. Where do we position the sound now? A somewhat reasonable answer might be both. Okay, why don't we add another property of sound? It can, very simply put, penetrate through objects. For the sake of simplicity, all we need to know for now is that lower frequencies can penetrate thicker obstacles than higher frequencies, similar to how sound can bend. We are now making the wall dividing our rooms really thin. Additionally to bending around the door frames, some lower frequencies of the voice would now also penetrate the wall and reach a listener as well. And to make matters worse, the frequencies that reach the listener would largely depend on the material and thickness of the wall. We are already at a complexity that, to my knowledge, no game truly simulates to this extent. But why don't we add a little bit more before we take a little breather? We said that lower frequencies can penetrate through our thin walls. But what happens to the higher frequencies that don't? Without getting into too much detail, some frequencies will get absorbed and others will be reflected back into the room. And after being reflected back into the room, they will again reflect off or get absorbed by all the other surfaces they hit on their way. Naturally, the same is true for the original voice of the speaker as well. The sound spreads inside the room and starts reflecting off the ceiling, walls, floor and even the speaker themselves. Many of these reflections will eventually make their way through the door frames into the room our listeners in, where they continue to bounce until they eventually reach the listener. And don't forget that every reflection can again also bend around the door frames. But sound travels a lot slower than light, around 343 meters per second. So all these individual reflections take different amounts of time before they finally reach the listener in the room. The result is called reverb. Most people connect it to churches and concert halls as large spaces have a long reverberation time because the reflected sound takes so long to reach the listener. Okay, after all this input, let's take a breather and look at how games tackle absorption and reverb. And the answer is quite sobering. Absorption is usually barely taken into consideration. Reverb, on the other hand, has always been and still is one of the hottest topics in game audio. And despite of that, pretty much everything out there is tricky mimicking at best. The simplest, most brute force thing that games can do to simulate reverb is to simply play different sounds when the listener is inside a room. In AMA 3, for example, footsteps inside of buildings have no real-time reverb on them, but rather play a dedicated walking inside sound. Similarly, it is common to change the reverb tails of guns when firing them inside a room. In some cases, games may switch between different sounds depending on the size of the room or even its material. The Battlefield series comes to mind here. Another option is it to use a reverb audio effect which generates the reverb in real time. 
either based on an algorithm or by copying the reverb characteristics of a real place. The downside of the solution is the fact that these real-time reverb effects can eat a lot of performance, which is why games usually cut many corners in order to use as little of them as possible. They also tend to sound very synthetic in many situations because, well, they ultimately are. What all solutions have in common is that they, again, do not actually simulate each sound wave traveling through and reflecting off of the environment, but rather use simplified methods to approximate a convincing effect. I think a good visual comparison in games are generic reflections oftentimes used on things like buildings. They look okay when not looking too close, but don't reflect the actual world at all. Literally. Funny enough, searching for ray-traced audio online will yield a lot of results. But all of them, too, are not about actually simulating every single sound wave. Rather, they are about clever, somewhat procedural methods of getting a rough set of data about the general environment in order to tweak the parameters of the aforementioned artificial reverb effects. Alright, ready for some last push back into the world of understanding sound complexity? Then let's talk about the sound of things that are far away. Starting with why sounds get quieter over distance. You see, sound in and on itself is just energy in the form of vibrations. If we hear sound from loudspeakers, it is because we used electrical energy in order to make the speakers vibrate, which in turn caused the air to vibrate. Long story short, we need energy to make something vibrate. As the sound travels through the air, it continuously expands its energy, causing it to become quieter. So far, so good. But you might have noticed that faraway sounds usually also sound a lot duller and miss their high frequency content. This is because higher frequencies require more energy to propagate than lower ones and therefore become quieter a lot quicker. It's kinda like the difference between regular walking and sprinting. The relatively low step frequency of walking will allow you to walk for hours and cover a long distance, but you'll be out of breath after a high frequency sprint after a relatively short distance already. These so-called volume and frequency attenuations over distance are common features in most games. Volume attenuation is usually handled via a mathematical function that attenuates the volume of a sound the further it is away. Frequency attenuation is usually achieved by using a so-called low-pass filter. It filters out higher frequencies and lets lower frequencies pass through. And the distance to an object determines at which frequency this filtering starts. It's not exactly a one-on-one -on -one simulation, but gets the job done. This brings us to today's last puzzle piece, which is the speed of sound. Have you ever noticed that, for example, a distant airplane sounds weirdly whooshy and uneven, while a close one seems to have a clear engine sound? The speed of sound plays a large role here. I've previously mentioned that sound travels with around 343 meters per second through air. That was not really accurate though. In reality, the speed of sound through air depends on both air temperature and humidity. The warmer and more humid the air, the faster sound can travel. On their way from the airplane to the listener, different sound waves can travel through pockets of air that vary in temperature and humidity, causing the sound to slow down in some areas and speed up in others. On top of that, wind blowing in different directions or wind turbulences can further increase the difference in local speed of a sound wave. The result is that the listener is not hit by an even wavefront, but a smeared and distorted version of it. Because sound waves add and subtract one another, these wave interferences can cause the typical seemingly random swelling in the perceived volume and characteristics. It might not surprise you to hear that these sorts of complex sound propagation are not really simulated in the gaming world at all. For loud noises over distance, such as airplanes, gunshots and explosions, it is common practice to simply blend between close and distant versions of a sound in order to emulate the real-life behavior. Phew, we've covered a lot of ground today. And that was only a fraction of the characteristics of sound we could talk about. Now, imagine the sheer amount of computing power required to truly simulate the behavior of sound in real time. We'd have to track every air molecule as the sound spreads in every direction, while every blade of grass, every leaf on a tree, every crevice in a rock and every street sign could potentially let through, absorb or reflect the sound. We'd have to simulate local atmospheric conditions in order to faithfully track each air molecule as its speed is affected by them. And we'd have to do it for potentially hundreds of sound emitters simultaneously, with no real room to cheat because every little and large object on its way will contribute to the final sound that reaches the listener. <laughs> 
I'm sure we'll get there someday. But until then, I honestly don't think we're missing out on too much. In the end, being 100% realistic is not a guaranteed sign of quality. Going back to video game graphics, I think an argument is to be made that a lot of titles start to look quite similar in their overall style, especially when it comes to lighting. And it makes sense. If the goal of all games would it be to look like reality, eventually they would all look the same. Like reality. A game that could visually or sonically recreate reality one to one might not automatically look or sound better, just different. A good example are some screenshot comparisons of games with and without ray tracing. To me, oftentimes I can pragmatically deduct that the lighting makes more sense, but can't help to think that the non-ray traced images look more visually pleasing at times. That's just my subjective experience though. I do not want to romanticize old graphics, but there's another aspect worth thinking about if you ask me. The fact that developers had to trick so much back in the day to achieve certain visual effects led to the fact that many games had a very distinct visual identity, despite oftentimes trying to achieve the same goal of relative realism. I feel that this is the time game audio is in right now. And it fills me with a sense of… contemporary nostalgia to know that today's video game soundscapes are still created with all that ingenuity and trickery of their creators. But that's it for today. So thanks and have a good one.